morning doing things a little bit different, where I'm going to be your scripture reader this morning, because it's integrated with my message this morning. And the title of the message is, How's Your Leaves? You know, my titles are interesting. What was it last week? Honey, I shrunk the camel. <laughs> Oh, I got a good laugh here. Right? <laughs> I'm going to talk to this side. <laughs> How's your leaves? Hmm. Where's he going with that this morning? Do you know that leaves on your plants or trees determine how healthy the plant is? And I know this because my trees, one has failed this summer along my driveway, which means so much to me that were planted 20 years ago and one has died because I see a, a woodpecker in it and it's going and it's going. It's like apparently when woodpeckers go in trees, that means they're dead or very close to it. Well, this woodpecker has got a, a nice peck all the way around it. So these trees mean a lot to me and they're pretty good size to replace them would be pretty costly. So I reached out to Cornell University and asked for someone to come by and give me some advice. And I had an arborist there to tell me about my trees. <laughs> it's amazing how much you learn when you, when you want to. But leave the leaves, the color, if you see yellow-green color, it could indicate a nitrogen, nitrogen deficiency. Leaves curl upward could indicate the plant is missing the needed nutrients. Leaves curl downward. I know, you're going to leave here all educated on trees. <laughs> Leaves curl downward could indicate that the plant is trying to process too many nutrients. I'm not making this up. Leaves turn yellow indicates the plant is under stress. Hmm. You might say, what do plants have to do with humans? Well, we will find out right after the funny this morning because we pause for a funny. So we're going to talk about trees some more, but we're also going to talk about what are we producing? What's our fruit look like? Right? We are to bear fruit, the scriptures remind us. What does your fruit look like? We'll talk about that some more. The end is nearer than you thought, is the title of my funny this morning. A priest and a pastor are standing by the side of the road holding up a sign that reads, The end is near. Turn around now before it's too late. A passing driver yells, You guys are nuts. Pretty typical, though. You could hear that today. And speeds, and speeds right past them. From around the curve, they hear screeching tires. Then a big splash. The priest turns to the pastor and says, do you think we should just put up a sign that says bridge out instead? <laughs> <laughs> if you love that, give God a hand. <laughs> I'd like to read from Luke 8 this morning, NIV version. And uh, it goes as follows. This is the parable of the four soils. Uh, parables, by the way, are really educational. Um, they are brought to us to help us learn. That's really the purpose of the parables. For us to, you know, maybe some of the more sophisticated scriptures, and I'll put my hand up first, you know, they don't resonate with us, me. I'll speak for me. But the parables are, are very simple messages for us to get it. You know, hit over the head, you know, get it. Tells the parables of the four soils. His disciples asked him, with what this meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that through seeing you may not see, through hearing they may not understand. Hmm. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones we hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. So what is being said 
in this first message. Luke's book is a present to of an accurate account of the life of Christ and to present Christ as a perfect man and savior. Parables are written, as I said, not to simply read the scriptures, but to help us relate to situations in our own lives, basically, so we get it. Let's see where you fall in, these, in this overall parable. Verse 9 through 12 that I just read indicates that we are weak. Boy, we don't want to admit that, do we? I'm weak. I didn't live that way most of my life, folks. Because we always think we got it going on. We got it fixed. I don't need anybody. I lived that way for many years. I say, unfortunately, I could have had that peace that passes all understanding in my younger years. Not that I didn't believe in God. I believed in God my whole life. But did I have the peace that passes all understanding in my life? Hmm. We have lack of confidence. And at times come to church for a check mark in our week. Those along the path are the ones who fear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. I'm going to go back to the trees how deep of our roots are. Are we a Sunday Christian? We show up at church on Sunday? Are we a Monday Christian where we're adding Bible study to our lives? Are we a Thursday Christian where we're doing work in the clothing ministry? What are you? What am I? Not that those things aren't good because we are called to serve God. Those things are extremely valuable in each one of our lives because it does create the balance that we need. We need the balance in life. But if the roots don't go down deep, without God we are nothing. Amen? Amen. Without God we are nothing. <clears throat> we think we can do it on our own. Well, guess what? We can't. Say, I can't. Can. It's not possible. The devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so they may not believe and be saved. The devil is real, folks. Satan is real. He comes, John 10, 10, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the devil does. I can assure you when something good is going on that the devil is sitting on the sidelines waiting for something to happen. Waiting for our heart to fall waiting for depression to come in, waiting for an opening to come into our lives, to come into our heart, and change your thought of something being wonderful. For instance, maybe you, you say, God, you know what, here I am, send me. You say, yes, here I am, send me. You research it, and after you said yes, you're like, oh man, I don't know what I got myself into. Be careful when you say yes. <laughs> well, with me, all things are possible, God says. Do we live on that? Do we live on those words? Do we really trust God? I will trust in you. You just sung it. I heard you. I heard each one of you just got done singing that song. I will trust in you. How much are you willing to trust in Him? Is He Lord of your life? Hmm. The devil cannot get a foothold in our lives, folks. It takes us down a dark tunnel. And we've all been there. We all have been in a dark tunnel. We can't let that happen. Verse 13. Those on rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it. Here we go. You don't want to hear this rest of it, I don't think. But they have no roots. Those on rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy. You received the word this morning. 
You're in a place, you're in a comfortable place, you're in a sanctuary, you're in God's house, you're hearing the word, you're jubilant this morning, you feel good about the service, you leave here and you, you're all done. You're all done. Unless we sink our roots into God's word. You know, I say often to not only read the scriptures, you can read them. You can read the book of Luke right through tomorrow morning and, and, and think you've really accomplished something. But after you read a book in the Bible, how much do you retain? Now, some of you are more gifted than others, and I'm not quantifying. But my approach is, as I've said more than once, find a scripture that you need to hear right now. What is speaking to you in the morning? A scripture, if you're hurting, you have pain, you have struggles, you, you care about your sister, your brother, your mother, your sister, whatever, find a scripture that means something to you. Live that scripture all day. Breathe that scripture all day. Resonate that scripture all day. So that maybe you'll memorize it, maybe not. I'm not good at that. I have a few scriptures that I can recite, but beyond that, I look everything up every week. Because I'm not blessed that way. But live, breathe that scripture so that the word becomes alive in you. You can have, a, I'm going to go back to my 17 inches. You're forcing me to do this. There's 17 inches, some scholar said, between the heart and the brain. How you doing? You getting down here? But I'm going to tell you, you're not going to get here unless you work at it. You're intentional about it. It's not going to happen on its own. Father God, I'm going to church. Fix me. I'm going to church. Fix this. Fix my brother. It doesn't work that way. We can think it does, and we can get the check mark off that I went to church. I'm good for the week until next Sunday. We need to dive into God's Word. We need to meditate on God's Word. That's the word that's not used enough in scriptures in the story today. Meditation. That doesn't mean you carry your phone into a room and you're listening to your phone go off while you're trying to read a scripture and understand it. I'll raise my hand on that one. I do much better. I got a little, I got a little spot in my basement, in my man cave, if you will, it's got all my scriptures all written down. Anybody see The War Room? Anybody see that movie? <laughs> if you haven't seen that movie, you have to see that movie. Right out there. Right. You have to see that movie because it's a space set aside for you to immerse yourself into God. Leave all the outside distractions away. You know, we're so busy people. We just want to Go, go, go. And listen, I'm as busy as anybody. So I don't want to hear somebody say, I don't have time. That's, that's an excuse. That's an excuse for all of us. If you love God and God is Lord of your life, you're going to want to know about Him. You're going to, you're going to want to know, what is, God, what is this God? What is, what is He all about? He is Savior of the world. You are His children. He loves you unconditionally. Wants the very best for each one of you. If you don't believe that, you're wasting your time coming to church. I know, Pastor, you're kind of stepping over, over the edge here a little bit. God loves you. You love your children. Any of you that have children, you love your children more than yourself. You would do anything for your children. Amen? Amen. God doesn't love you any less. God will be there for you. But he's not going to do it without your assistance. You're a partner with God. And you need to give up yourself to God. Not to this world, because we're leaving it all behind. There's none of us towing a trailer to our funeral. At least I haven't seen one yet. Maybe. Being rooted. 
We put up a front. I think of Joyce Meyer's comments where she would fight with her husband, going back to verse 13, the rocky soil and we have no roots. We're really not connected to God. I go back to Joyce Meyer's comments where she would fight with her husband all the way to church. I've said this more than once. She would yell and scream at her husband all the way to church. She's a TV evangelist, which I watch five or six times a week. She would walk in the church doors and say, Hallelujah, brother, it's so good to see all y'all. Church service is over. Stays for a little coffee. Gets back in the car. If you think I'm cooking you dinner tonight, you've got another thing coming. <laughs> We want everyone to think we have it all together, don't we? What's the song? It escapes me, but we've shared it more than once here about uh, I'm all right, I'm all right. Come into church. It's not, it's not coming to me, but we want everybody to think we're okay. But inside we're hurting. Inside we're really hurting. Mm. This is the place for the hurting. This is, this is God's house for us to come and to be able to talk with God and, and let Him know how you're feeling. Let Him know that you need help. And please forgive me, God, that I've gone off into a ditch. Please forgive me. Because we either don't want to, inside we're really hurting, because we either don't want to go deep into God's Word or don't think we have to. You know, I think the latter part of that statement is we don't think we have to. You know why? Because we think tomorrow's a, tomorrow will come. We don't need to go deep. How many times have I said tomorrow is not promised? There isn't any one of us that tomorrow is promised. And for some reason we think that we can put God on the shelf over here. And I was one of these people. Was. Past tense. Thank God. We got a little shelf over here. We can set the Bible on here. How many of us have a Bible that's got dust on it? Or better yet, how many people have a Bible? We set it over here on the shelf, and we might get it if we're really in a difficult situation. But you know, God doesn't want a piece of us. He wants all of us. Amen. He wants every bit of everything about us. And you know what that brings in your life? It brings the happiness in your life that you never knew existed. It brings the joy in your life that you never knew existed. The joy and peace. We're going to talk about that in the coming weeks. Joy, peace, love. We're going to talk about that. God wants only what's best for his people. We don't think we have to go deep. But in fact... If you're okay with life the way it is right now and you're as happy as you think you could ever be, then stay there. That's okay. But I can assure you there's something deeper for you. God is waiting to pour his favor on you, again, that you may not even know exist. No roots. Mm. How about the disciples when Jesus was beaten and whipped to death? What did the disciples do? Hmm. They hit it. So in your time of trouble, in your time of greatest need, what are you going to do? Don't wait until that time comes, folks. Don't wait until that time comes where you really desperately need God. Because if you create a habit, if you create a habit in your life that is something about Jesus, you will find that peace inside you. The peace that passes all understanding. And I can tell you, I haven't arrived, but I have more peace today than ever before in my life. But it didn't just happen. It took me effort and energy to achieve that. You see, we go with our prayers to God about things we want and things we need. But we must realize that, as I said, God wants to pour his favor on us. But he's not going to do it for you. 
God will make a way for you to achieve happiness and joy. But he's not going to do it for you. He needs your attention. He needs your undivided attention. Not just when it's convenient. Not just on Sunday morning. But every day of your life. The more we give him, the more we will receive. Amen? Amen. Verse 14. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. Let me read that again. I talked about baby Christians last week. How long are we going to stay baby Christians? When, are, when do we become a mature Christian? Again, that doesn't just happen on its own. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries. We don't worry. I'm talking to the wrong crowd. Sorry. Life's worries, life's riches, and life's pleasures. And they do not mature. Spending time with God and to understand what His will is for our lives is the only way to choke out life's words. <clears throat> we can spend time to worry all we want. And if we worry, and if I ask how many people worry, I think everybody's hand could go up or should go up. And mine, I raise mine first and the highest. But if you can spend the time to worry, you can spend the time to worry on the Scripture. Amen? Amen. You're filling your time with negative if the worry is consuming you and the devil has a foothold. As opposed to meditating on that scripture that means so much to you. <clears throat> we are to be of the world, not in the world. We are to be God's children. We are to be set aside. We are to be different. We are not to conform to this world's ways. Amen? Amen. We are not to conform to these world's ways. Verse 15. But the seed on good soils, here we go. We're going to get to some good stuff here. Again, my question at the beginning was, where do you see yourself in these different seeds? But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by, preserve, and by persevering, produce a crop. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, meaning we mean well, you mean well, and I think we all mean well, it's a pretty fair statement, who hear the word, they hear the word, here it comes. They retain it. I already said how we can retain it. Find a scripture that means something to you. Meditate on it. And guess what? When you meditate, you don't have room for that worry category. That's, you don't have time for the worry. Because you're meditating on a scripture. You're meditating on that scripture that can help you or a loved one. That can mean so much. Retain it. That's the piece we need to do, folks. We need to retain the scriptures. Not just some pastor standing up at the pulpit and sharing what these scriptures say. Because that's not retaining it. That's sharing it, but it's not going to be retained. If I asked you what the scriptures were from last week, last Sunday, who would know? But anybody, she's got a book, she's going to show me. <laughs> Or, or let me back it up. Let me, let me ask you Wednesday. You're going to remember what I said? How about tomorrow in a conversation with your daily activities? Are you going to remember what the pastor up here said today? You know what used to happen about 100 years ago? 75, 100 years ago? After the church service, 
a parishioner would decide to have lunch or even dinner and they would go to someone's house and everybody would congregate together at someone's house. They would talk about the message. They would talk about the scriptures. They would talk about how, what does that mean? What do these words that I'm sharing mean to you and me in our lives? That's what they used to do. You see, the message here is, if we don't do something proactive with these words, they're gone. They're gone. They're, don't even think that you're going to retain them because you're not. You see, we need help from God. We need help from God. We can't do it on our own. We'd like to think we can, but we can't. We're not going to retain His Word. We're not going to immerse ourselves into what God has to offer unless we're intentional about doing it. Setting time aside. How many people during the week set time aside for God? I'm not talking about driving down the road. I'm not talking about, you know, uh, saying prayers at dinner time. I'm talking about setting time aside for just God and only God. How many people do that today in society? <coughs> I don't know the numbers. Paul's a numbers guy. I talked to him yesterday. He loves numbers. Or was it Luke? I don't remember one of them. But, but, but no. God is being removed from everything. We've had this conversation over and over. God is being removed. Because nobody wants to think that God is valuable anymore. He's dispensable. Well, you folks come to church. God means something to you. I pray. I pray God means something to you. Well, if he means something to you, that means you, you give God a little more of you. A little more of your time. A little more of your energy. So, the word, we hear the word, retain the word, and by preserve, per, pers persevering, by persevering, produce a crop. You see the message overall there in verse 15. We have, we have good intentions, and you folks do. You have good intentions. It's great. It really is wonderful. Because we have to start with that. You hear the word, and you retain it. How is retaining it for you? Every one of us are different. How I retain it will be different from how you retain it. How is it? But don't expect to retain it if you think that it's just going to happen. It takes work. It takes effort. And then by persevering, produce a crop. Persevering, produce a crop. In other words, don't give up. Don't give up on God. Where things might be going off into a ditch, don't ever give up on God. Don't ever say, God, why did you do this? Or why did you do that? Say, God, thank you for being in my life. Thank you for this, this obstacle in my life. And I know that it is in your plan to make things better. And you will provide opportunities for all of us to grow in a better and mightier way for him. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen? Persevering so that you produce a good crop. Going back to the sermon title, How's Your Leaves? <laughs> Are we a good soil for our grandkids? There's a question. Are we a good example for our grandkids? I'm not looking for an answer, but, but really process that. What kind of soil do we cultivate in our lives? Because if we think that we're going to act differently when our grandkids are around, yeah, and I think to a certain point we do, but kids are not dumb. Kids are not dumb. They get it. They're going to act like the adults act. Sometimes dumb and stupid. <laughs> but what are we cultivating, folks? What are you cultivating? What am I cultivating? Am I being an example for the kids? Do the kids see us with terrible habits. But we love God. 
With all the love in our heart, I love Jesus, but I got a terrible bad habit that the grandkids see. What kind of soil is that? What kind of soil is that? We constantly want to say these kids are lost. They don't know what to do. Well, it's up to us to get them unlost. Amen? Amen. It's not someone else's job. It's our job. What are we doing for our grandkids? Do we set good examples for the people around us? I can tell you that I have a whole, since I gave my Christ to God in 1999, I have a whole new set of friends. A whole new set of friends that I can call friends. Think about who you hang around with. Think about what you're cultivating. I'm going to go back to a statement I made earlier. If you're okay where you're at, and life's wonderful for you, stay there. Stay there. That's okay. But, don't ask God for prayers that you want something and expect to get it. Don't expect it. God is going to continually love you no more than he does this very second. He will love you always until one day, like the prodigal son, his, seeing his father at the end of the road coming home and his father receiving him with open arms. That's the love our father has. His father didn't immediately chastise him, complain to him, squandering all his wealth. He didn't start doing that. He received his son with open arms. When was the last time to, to, you read a Bible verse and carried it all day? We already talked about that. We pat ourselves on the back when we read God's Word, but the idea of reading it is to live it. It isn't about the knowledge of just reading the Scriptures. It's living it. The more you live it, the more it becomes who you are, and more importantly, whom you are. Is God really, is, is God Lord of your life? Hmm. Is God really Lord of your life? With our false pretenses, with our walls that we put up to make us look good, we feel good. I can tell you faith and feelings have nothing to do with one another. Faith is acting when it feels like you, you need to do the right thing and you know you should. And it's painful. Faith is acting when you know you need to do the right thing and you're in a difficult situation. That's faith. It's not a feeling. Well, I feel like this or I feel like that. Well, my friends want to go out drinking tonight. I need to go do that. Or I'm going to lose a friend. Well, again, look at your friend circle. If that's what you want, I mean, you know, I'm called by God to stand here and share these words. And how they resonate is not my, up to me. How they resonate is what God is trying to say in and through me for us to hear. For us to try and understand that God loves us so much and he wants the very best, but it takes work on our part. Amen? Amen? Amen. We pat ourselves on the back when we read the word. We need to live it. When it becomes part of who you are, that is evident by the fruit that you produce. And I can assure you, the friends that you used to have may not be, say, your friends, but you will find a whole new set of friends. Because you know why? You will have something that nobody else has. Or you will have something that people say, wow. I want to be like you. How did you do that? How did, how did you get this way? You're very different. You don't blend in. You don't go with the crowd. We're not supposed to. We're supposed to be set aside. Amen? Are your leaves bright green or are they yellow? 
If you remember early on, I shared the yellow leaves, and the sad part is some of my trees are very yellow this year. My leaves were yellow, and they're strained. And I knew they were struggling. And I don't want to lose my trees. However, we sometimes have yellow leaves, don't we? Don't we have yellow leaves at times? And you know what society seems to want to do when they have yellow leaves is they want to, they want to draw to, to drugs and alcohol and, and become addicted to these things. This is real. This is real. If you don't see that in society today, open your eyes a little wider. This is real out there. And we are to be set apart. We are to be different. We are to work on cultivating our soil so that our leaves are bright green. I've got some trees that are just so beautifully green. Not enough, but I, they're beautiful. And I have some that are brown, leaves curled up, leaves curled down. Sad part is I have some yellow leaves as well. The world of uncertainty can and does deliver some rather uncomfortable and painful situations. I think we could all attest to that. But with our trust in God, he will deliver you from every one of them. Hear this. I'm getting close to my end. He will deliver you from every one of your painful, uncomfortable situations. And if you're experiencing one right now, if you're listening to my live stream, if you're experiencing a difficult challenge in your life right now, here's the word from Mark 12.30. It says, You shall love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. I'm not certain there's no wiggle room here. <laughs> you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. I don't know if you noticed, but all is in front of each one of them, and that's the scripture. Those aren't my words, that's the scriptures. All of your heart, all of your soul, and with all your mind and with all your strength. Say all. All. That doesn't mean part of it. Doesn't mean I want to give God a little bit today. I'm, I'm good. It means all. All of it. Resonate this week. All of it. Strength, mind, body, soul. Hmm. <coughs> And I said, there's no wiggle room. No matter how hard we try to cover up bad attitudes, deeds, or words, we cannot deceive God. Very important to hear that. This facade that we have, this deceiving that we have, this cover-up that we have, God knows our very thoughts right this minute. God knows what you're thinking that I got a lunch date and this pastor's got to finish up here pretty quick. Whatever. God knows us. Inside and out, up and down, east, west, north and south. He knows the very hair on our heads. So we can't kid with God. Can we? I don't think so. So if we can't kid with God, why do we have these, why do we have bad attitudes? Why do we say words that aren't comforting to other people? Because we do. Because we fall from grace. And we fall from grace because God is an evident in our lives through the word. Instead of hiding our faults, we should ask God to change our lives so that we no longer have to be ashamed. You see, we don't want to also expose our past a lot of us don't want to expose our past. I talk about my past all the time up here. Because you know why my past, guess what, is the past. It means zero. But if we can all learn from our past, you have something to share in you about your past that you don't want to tell anybody about. But with God, you can help somebody. You can help somebody else from going into a ditch. You can help somebody live a, a healthier, happier life with joy and peace in their heart. 
You can do it. I can do it. How much are you willing to do it? Only when you confess your hidden sins and seek God's forgiveness will you have, you will have the help you need to do it right. In other words, trust in God. Amen? Amen. Trust in God. I come up here, I don't always know the words I'm going to say, folks. Matter of fact, most of this is really off script here this morning. <laughs> because God puts it in me to share what I need to share. Every week, this is not me. Because you know why? I seek that. I pray about that. My Sunday morning devotions, <laughs> I, I don't want to do this alone. I don't want to live life alone without God. Amen? Amen? And when each one of us get to that point that we don't want to live alone without God, our lives will change. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Amen. You are uniquely designed to have bright green leaves. Each one of you can produce bright green leaves. Let's walk together in love and watch the colors change. Amen? Amen. Amen.